Hello, my name is Andrew Gary, and welcome to Seismic Sound Off, in-depth conversations in applied geophysics. One of the most important functions of a professional society is honoring those who have made significant contributions to the profession and to science. And in 2018, SEG added a new prestigious annual honor. Craig J. Beasley was the driving force behind the founding of Geoscientists Without Borders. In recognition of his contribution, the Craig J. Beasley Award for Social Contribution was established and is awarded to a person or organization that has made a meritorious achievement that supports the application of geophysics to a humanitarian, public service, or other socially significant cause. The inaugural Craig J. Beasley Award was awarded this year to Paul Bowman, who has spent more than 10 years doing humanitarian geophysical work in Uganda, Indonesia, and Malawi. And in this episode, I speak with Paul Bowman. Paul has continually showed remarkable commitment, great project leadership and management skills, and the ability to align sponsorship involvement. The results of his humanitarian work are documented and disseminated globally through his blog and publications. This podcast has highlighted his humanitarian work before in episode 37, Searching for Water in Kakuma. I encourage you to take a listen. In this conversation, Paul and I discuss what attracted him to the geosciences, the biggest source of inspiration in his career, and advice for students and early career professionals. Paul joins me next. So what was your reaction when you learned you would receive the inaugural Craig J. Beasley Award for Social Contribution? Yeah, I was certainly uh, really pleased and and excited that that the SEG for for really what it, what I think is the f- the first time that they recognize that themselves that there's a heck of a lot more you can do with geophysics other than find resources. So I, so I I was excited to see that the SEG was really embracing this idea that there's a lot of wonderful things you can do with geophysics that not only in, in terms of um, developing the resources of the world but also in terms of improving uh, social impact, society, and the, the needs of the planet. What attracted you to a career in the geosciences? You know, initially, I, I think it was a lot of the things that, that attracted most people to the geosciences. And, and, you know, you have to put me in the, the time frame of my, my life. I went to university in uh, 70, well, my, I did my undergrad, Princeton, New Jersey in 19, 1976 to to 81. And so this is pre-computer age, pre-internet, pre-cell phones. And, you know, the, the world was a, seemed like a much, much bigger, bigger place then. And I, I was interested in science, interested in engineering, but I wanted to be outdoors. I wanted to travel. I wanted to see the world. I wanted to solve problems. Uh, you know, geoscience, you equate with exploration as a you know, a young kid, exploration is just the whole idea of exploration, whether it's for resources or, or the moon or mountains or the ocean. That's, it has, has a certain cachet, a certain dra- lot of drama to it, and especially in the times. And so, yeah, that, that, that's, what, that's what I was looking for. What led you to specialize in, in not only geophysics, but also hydrogeology as well? Initially, I, like I said, I... I Began my my studies as a geological engineer at at Princeton, and and of course, there's a lot of different areas you can you can move into in in geological engineering. And and initially, uh, you know, going back to the 80s, uh, actually the 70s, and trying to remember my mindset then. I and and you know you have to remember again, not always before the computer age, but but it's really just the beginning of the environmental movement and really just the beginning of our understanding that that this planet is of limited size. And I, I think my initial drive was was the idea of building things, building dams, building roads. I think it was early on, maybe my freshman and uh, uh, sophomore year, I, I kind of came to the realization that there's too many roads, too many dams. And I started getting interest in other aspects of, of geoscience, in particular um, marine geology. And, and you know, that I, I thought would be, a, again, a, a nice fit with this idea of exploring the world and traveling and, and doing adventure, adventurous things. And I, and I actually was incredibly fortunate to have two internships um, at two of the three marine science labs, underwater labs in the world, one in St. Croix, and then where I was for work for a summer, and then one for a year in the in on the Red Sea at the Heinz Stennis Marine Lab in 
in Eilat at the southern tip of tip of Israel. And I, and I was there doing what I think to most people in the world probably, and to me at the time, it would seem like a dream job. I was diving three times a day, studying how corals grow, mapping corals, diving up and down this virgin territory along the Red Sea. And and it was great. But on, on the weekends, I, I would go I would go on trips, go on hiking trips into the desert, into the into the Sinai Peninsula. And um, it was actually very, very profound. I'd never seen a landscape like that where, where you could just see 100% of the geology. It was, this, it was there for your viewing. And one of the most, um, I guess, interesting aspects of that were meeting the people that lived there, the, the Bedouins. At the time, there were 15,000 people living in Sinai, almost all Bedouins, living in an area three times the size of, of all of Israel. And in, in some areas where it would rain occasionally, maybe once every two or three or five, five years. And these people, they would know how to find water. They'd know where to look at it. And they weren't geologists. They weren't geophysicists. They hadn't gone to school, but they had this intuitive understanding of where to find springs, where to dig. And, and it was just fascinating and, and inspiring. And, and I tried to combine what I saw with them and learned from them with my geological knowledge. And then when I went back to Princeton, I taken a year off when I went back to Prince and I started to focus on, um, on water resources. And so, yeah, that's how I, um, I, I really got inspired and moved in the, in the direction of, of hydrogeology. How did your early job with Schlumberger impact your career? So initially when I, when I graduated from Princeton, I, um, you know, my, my main focus was high, was in water resources and hydrogeology and and, but I, I also I wanted to travel. I wanted to work outdoors. And the number one job I wanted was, it was a position with the Peace Corps, actually. So I applied to a number of the Peace Corps programs, all the Peace Corps programs I could find that had to do with water resources. And I didn't accept it, get accepted to any of them because um, you know, they wanted someone with experience. And I didn't have experience at that, at that time. There, there were opportunities to teach English, but that's, that's not what I wanted to do. So this was, this was 1980, 1981. And, um, so, you know, again, in that same idea of, of traveling and working outside, I, um, I applied to oil company jobs, a lot of oil company jobs. I didn't get any offers at all. And, and I, I, I think they saw I wasn't the type of person to, to sit in an office. But I, but I did apply to, to Schlumberger. And for all the same reasons, I didn't get a job with an oil company. I did get a job with, with them, position with them. And for the next five years, I, I worked with Schlumberger in, um, in some of them. What, even then were some of the most remote locations in the world. And so for four years, I was working in um, Indonesian Borneo. And for three of those years, I was on a remote island, the only foreigner living on a remote island off the coast of Borneo. And through the course of uh, work, working with Schlumberger, I, w- I was working in the, in the middle of the jungle, hiring my own crews, often... Uh, people that were literally just one generation removed from, from being headhunters, headhunters, training those crews, building the shops. Um, I was responsible for millions of dollars of equipment um, at the age of 20, 20 at the age of 21, 22, um, logging trucks, a heli rig, um, traveling everywhere by helicopter, small planes, small boats going up, going up rivers. You know, through the course of that, I, I learned a lot of things. One thing I learned was that probably the most important life lesson you could ever learn is that anything is, impo- anything is possible. And so, for instance, when these GWB projects I've done over, over the last few years in remote refugee camps or in, in zones that were in areas that were in war for, for decades, you know, having that experience, Schlumberger, before working all over Borneo, Papua New Guinea, without backup, without manuals, without telephones, without computers, completely on my own. You, you know, you, you get a lot of self-reliance, a lot of self-confidence. You recognize every day you will have problems, but every day you will also have, uh, have solutions. So that, that was certainly the big life lesson I got out of working for Schlumberger. And then um, the geophysics aspects. I, I have to say, I wasn't, after graduating from university and from Princeton, I wasn't particularly interested in, in geophysics. It was just another, seemed a little more geeky mathematical aspect of, of the geosciences. It wasn't my, certainly was, was not my first love. But working with Schlumberger, you're, you're doing geophysics literally 24-7. I could be working on a well site 
48, 72 hours. And, and again, in those days, you're doing everything. You're responsible for the electronics, collecting the data, interpreting the data, being one of just a couple engineers of, in Borneo or Papua New Guinea, an area the size of maybe big chunk of, of Western Europe. You, you were on your own. And we, we often felt like we were doing everything except drilling the well. So you learn a lot, just a, a huge, a huge amount about the science, about the instrumentation, about the equipment itself, and, and the interpretation, of course. And, and then another you know, great thing I learned in Schlumberger was um, how no matter how good you are, how smart you are, how much you know, you're relying on, on other people, the other people on the rig, the other people in the company, especially the other people in your crew and the, and the local crews. And I, I, all in all, I had a really successful career with uh, Schlumberger. And, and to a large part, it, it had to do with the, with the crews I had, the crews that I trained, uh, you know, the relationships we had and, and how well we worked together. And then, yeah, being on, on my own, uh, the way Schlumberger was very decentralized then, um, you know, I was responsible for all the work in Eastern Borneo, Kalimantan, all the work on Papua New Guinea. And, and you really learn a lot about running a business. I mean, you're running the shop, you're building the shop, you're training your staff, you're interfacing with what were then a lot of the biggest companies in, in the world, making decisions, 100 decisions a, a day. Uh, you know, it was a, just an astounding experience for, for somebody in their early and mid-20s. Did that give you not maybe the courage, but just the professional know-how and, and the knowing that you could do it to go out and start at Vizian? So after I, after I finished with Schlumberger, I, um, yeah, I decided to carry on in, in the sort of the, the original path I, I had started on and, and water resource work. But at that point, though, I, I was completely in love with geophysics. It was, it was essentially part of my DNA, having been living it for five years and and i could see the potential of, of what you could do with geophysics and, and water resources so I took my uh, first job after after grad school and and that was in a what was in a very small company we were just five people and and i was the the new guy out of school and so i knew all about all the geophysics stuff which nobody really cared about at the time but i was the I knew about the groundwater modeling and instrumentation and computers and contaminant movement and data loggers and all this kind of new instrumentation that was just coming out in the 90s. And of course, I wanted to learn all the practical aspects of, of hydrogeology. Um, you know, I'd done geophysics, lots of it, and I wanted to be drilling and putting in wells and putting in pumps. And, and for a while, I, I kind of put the geophysics behind and seemed much more dramatic, for instance, actually drilling a well than, than walking across the landscape with um, some piece of electronic instrumentation. But actually, the, uh, the romance of a, of a lot of aspects of hydrogeology kind of quickly wore off. I mean, I realized, for instance, very quickly that, sure, you can drill a well, but how do you know where to drill a well unless, unless you have some information, some geophysics to tell you where to drill it? And, and the reality is a lot of the aspects of hydrogeology that the hydrogeologists take credit for, you know, the, the drillers are the ones that are actually drilling the well and the labs are the ones that are doing the, the chemistry. And, and to a large, you know, degree, you're, as, the, as sort of the hydrogeologist on, on site, you're, you're more of a manager. And I wanted to be a, a doer at that time. So I started doing some geophysics. And early, I think it was 1991, we had one particularly huge success for a large water supply project that was, um, at the time, Canada's biggest industrial project, the Caroline gas plant. They, they needed a water supply and they drilled a lot of dry holes. And then a few days of geophysics, we, we ended up finding a number of 200 gallon per day wells. And pretty soon I was just doing geophysics and enjoying it. And pretty soon I had more than I could handle and, and started growing my group and kind of like the, the rest is history. You've, you've contributed to humanitarian crises and regions in need for decades from Indonesia to Uganda to Lithuania. What are you most proud of to date regarding your accomplishments and contributions to geophysics? I mean, that's a, it's a bit hard to say, and it, it's kind of varied over the years, but um, breaking that down into a, a few different aspects. Certainly one is, is the community water supply work we, we've done in Africa. I mean, there's, Africa is such a vast area with, with you know, whatever it is, 40, 40 plus countries. Um, 
you know, a continent uh, that could contain in its landmass the United States and all of Western Europe and big chunk of South, South America. And, and the way water supply, you know, has been done, it, it's just, you know, so hit and miss, so much get, guesswork, so many resources being, being wasted and so little knowledge actually being acquired. And, and certainly the work we've done in methodically studying, developing exploration techniques, applying those techniques, and, and actually delivering results in especially the crystalline basement aquifers, the, the Precambrian rock that covers about half of Africa. Africa. It's um, been very satisfying. It's, it's just so satisfying bringing water to these villages, teaching the villagers how to do it themselves, um, taking the, some of the more sophisticated geophysical techniques and boiling them down to something you can apply in a village, village level um, and actually you know, just bringing some science to really what's been a methodology of throwing a dot dot at the wall that that's been tremendous um you know the work in the my our work in the last few years of working with with refugees and internally dis- displaced persons in in africa and in bangladesh and elsewhere has you know been in- incredibly satisfying from a a number of of aspects uh, certainly just from the human aspects working with people with so much uh, resilience and courage and and everyone and every single person in a refugee or an IDP camp uh, has has such an amazing story of uh, survival to tell that's been uh, very moving and and motivating and 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 you know in these camps where you can have literally hundreds of thousands of people you can by finding a better water supply a cleaner water supply a new water supply a water supply lower in fluoride or lower in arsenic um, you can very quickly affect the lives of literally hundreds of hundreds of thousands of of people. So no question, this this refugee work's been very inspiring for myself. So yeah, I've had a lot of um, I guess prof- profound ex- experience. And then uh, you know, at this point in my career, I'm I'm well on in my career, and and you know, we all like everybody that's kind of been around a while will we'll certainly mouth the words how important it is to train and pass on knowledge to the next generation and but i i think at this point I, i'm where I, I actually believe it and and that's inspiring see you know seeing my my colleagues and younger colleagues and even training refugees and people in remote ugandan villages to do geophysical exploration to drill wells to repair pumps to um to you know bring some science to to a lot of aspects of exploration, whether it's archaeological, soils, water, resources, whatever, to bring, bring some real science to improving these um, approaches. That's a, that's a good segue to this next question. You know, for a student or early career professional within geophysics, hydrogeology, what would you like them to know as they embark on this career? A few things that, things that, some things that they might overlook, almost certainly will overlook some of the learning, some of the directions that you probably don't get in school. And, and, and one, one that's been very beneficial for me is seeing early on that everything you learn is, is important. Like it's not just the geophysics stuff and, and many aspects that's, that's even, even the least of it. Um, you know, traveling, seeing the world, you know, understanding how the world works, how, how, people, how people live, learning languages, um, learning about archaeology, history, other aspects of the geosciences, ge- learning about, you know, the applications are, are certainly just as important as the, as the actual science itself. So learning about soil science, groundwater, chemistry, everything is important. Everything becomes of value. I mean, I, I know when when I'm in the middle of, when I was in the middle of the jungle in, in Borneo and, and I had to find a small boat to go to town to, to get some spare parts for me, um, speaking some Indonesian was a heck of a lot important than analytical methods or uh, differential equations. So, so yeah, learn as much as you can about everything. And yeah, the geophysics stuff is important, but it's, it's not everything. And then, um, Taking um, 
every opportunity you get, when, when you have a chance, uh, a great opportunity to do something, take it. Doesn't matter how much money you get or don't get, how inconvenient it is in your, in your life. Don't wait for another chance because um, you just never know when you know, a similar opportunity will, will come around. Uh, there's one archaeologist I've, I've been working with um, for over 20 years, uh, Dr. Richard Freund, and, and I'll never forget the, the first time he, he, he called me. And, and without introducing himself or explaining what, what he, he wanted to do, the first thing he, he says on the telephone out, out of the blue was, how would you like to change the course of modern Jewish and Christian history? And, and of course, my, my first reaction was to hang up. I mean, it sounded like a complete crackpot but you know being a consultant you never know where your next piece of work will come from and it's you know it's led to some some of the most profound amazing experience for myself my family my colleagues and even a broadway play so so yeah take take every opportunity what is one thing you would like the public to understand about geophysics well you know generally the public probably knows absolute, not generally and probably, the public knows essentially absolutely nothing about geophysics nor anything that we do. And, and to a large degree, they probably couldn't care. But if you ask anyone in the public, anyone these days, would you have brain surgery without an MRI? Would you have a breast surgery without a mammogram? Would you have a, a bone um, set without an x-ray? Would you carry a baby to turn without ultrasound or some type of radiology, some type of imaging, they'd, they'd say, of course not. Like no one would think of having anything invasive done in the, the, hu- the human body without, without some type of imaging. And that's what we do, except, except with the earth. And similarly, so you, you look at, you know, a town or a city water supply, would you do a, a major multi tens of millions of dollar water, water exploration program in a city of town with, without some type of non-intrusive imaging? Uh, would you excavate a, an ancient city spending years and years and thousands of, of man years to excavate without some type of non-intrusive imaging? Would you put a major public utility, whether it's a, a water line or a sewer line under a, a river or a lake or build a subway un, under a city or, or put a community under an old bombing range in Cape Cod or California or Hawaii without some type of, of non-intrusive um, exploration? Of course you wouldn't. And, and so we're just as important to you know, what we do. It's just as important to making the world work as medical imagery as is to preserving human health. And, you know, it's, a, it's really as, as simple as that. And, and secondly, I'd, I'd say in, in this day and age, you look at the big problems affecting the world, environmental cleanup, finding, finding water, nuclear waste disposal, um, providing more food to the world food, through improved agriculture, providing industrial minerals for solar power, for wind power, and continuing to provide minerals that geophysics has been used for and, and still continues to be needed regardless of what happens in the future. So natural gas, coal, oil, um, various other minerals. Geophysics is fundamental to that. And so it's a, it's a science that, it's a very critical science that drives much of the way the world works uh, to this day and, and certainly will for many years to come. Is there anything else you would, you would like to share with the, the listeners before I let you go? Well, you know, I, I, I guess coming back to students and potentially going into a geoscience career, you know, I, so, so many careers, you imagine, what, you imagine what the career is like, and then you go to school and you're disappointed. And I, I think geoscience is, is the opposite. You imagine what the career is like. And school is great, but, you know, you do a lot of computer stuff, a lot of equations, a lot of math, and you kind of you think, this isn't, this isn't what I, I signed up for. But you get through that, and you get out, and, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's as exciting and interesting and rewarding and satisfying a career as, 
as you could have a dream of and 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 it's as exciting and creative as as, as you want to make it so yeah I, I certainly i certainly have no regrets and i and even with the downturn in the resource industries and and kind of a negative pall that that's falling over some aspects of of geosciences at at the same time with all the new problems of the world water environment co2 capture capture on and on there's all kinds of new new opportunities so i i i'd certainly encourage people to uh young people to to pursue those types of careers well that's a wonderful summary of, of what you've shared today thanks for your time and and looking back on your career to date and what's ahead for you well thank you thank you very much and uh, yeah i definitely appreciate the uh Hugely appreciate the the interest and the, and the focus on some of the work um, I've been carrying out again with um, massive support from from colleagues, friends, institutions like GWB, small NGOs like like Gizre, the UN, and and all that. It's been great. Thank you. At seg.org/podcast, you will find the complete show notes for this episode. Follow Seismic Sound off at seg.org slash podcast to hear new episodes or subscribe for free on your phone. Seismic Sound off is sponsored by the SEG Wiki, the place to find hundreds of biographies of geoscientists, open access tutorials, and ongoing translations of SEG's best-selling book, Robert Sherris Encyclopedic Dictionary. Type wiki.seg.org into your browser to visit the world's first online geophysics encyclopedia. Original music by Zach Bridges. This episode was hosted, edited, and produced by me, Andrew Gary. The SEG podcast team is Jennifer Crockett, Ashley Rodriguez, Ali McGinnis, and Mick Sweeney. Thank you for listening. This is Seismic Sound Off, signaling off. <laughs>